<laughs> Welcome to the Conscious Vibe, DJ. How you doing, brother? It's good to see you as always, man. Likewise. Yeah? yeah. How's the world treating you? It's good, man. It's good. Um, Dante Wright yeah, murder. I know. It has me going. Yeah, you know, I was actually looking at um, uh, I was looking at an article a little bit early on CNN. I was just like trying to get my brain around all of this. Uh, you know, I, and <clears throat> I don't think there's much to get around at this point. Kim Potter has reserved a place in hell for herself. Mm. That's how I look at it. Yeah. And, you know, to say you mistakenly grabbed a firearm in lieu of a taser, you're a 26-year vet, head no of the union. There's no way. Yeah, no way. Yeah. So welcome to hell. That's how I look at it. Doesn't work. Doesn't Let's work. introduce our guest. Well, yeah, I was going to lead in. Our guest, our esteemed guest, my friend, Dr. Matthew Whitaker. How Good are you, sir? You. What's up, Doc? I'm, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm just listening to the conversation before you introduced me. I was itching to jump in. So yeah. I, 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 I know you were. And Please you know do. What? <laughs> we're going to talk about all of that today because we want to obviously dig into some things that are really important. I know that as a diversity, equity, inclusion expert, uh, you have probably a lot of thoughts on this. But um, wanted to before we kind of jump into all that, one of the things we like to do with our guests is have them share, you know, background story. Obviously, I know a lot about your your background, your story mm -hmm. growing up. Um, share with that with, with our audience as well as DJ in terms of yeah. that piece of your story, what led you to where you are right now, Diamond Strategies, the work that you guys do there. So uh, let's talk about that. Certainly. I I'm happy to. I'm Arizona native, um, born and raised here um, at a time where um, most folks outside of Arizona didn't realize that there were black people here. Um, but I was raised in a black family on the southwest side, 3243 East Taylor Street. It was my grandmother's address, 602-233-0259, was the rotary phone number that I would dial. I remember that, <laughs> if you remember the old Chris Rock joke, right? Oh, yeah. um, it's my grandmother's house, and uh, grew up in, like I said, a black family in a predominantly Latinx neighborhood with um, two black parents who divorced, divorced uh, when I was it was final when I was six. My dad left, I think, when I was three or four. My mom then met my second mom, uh, Dr. Mary Radcliffe. So I grew up with two moms. Um, my mom's black, pansexual, um, womanist, not feminist. She identifies as womanist. And my second mom, Mima, is a white, female, upper middle class woman who was... Um, uh, divested of much of her privilege when she came out of the closet when she was younger and moved to South Phoenix and picked cotton. Yes, picked cotton. A lot of people don't realize that Arizona actually produced more cotton than Mississippi for decades in this country, um, alongside black and brown workers. So that was my background, a very diverse family, uh, of uh, a family that um, lived and breathed what we now call diversity, equity, and inclusion. I didn't know there was a name for it until I got to college and realized that um, homogeneity is or has or was the breath of life for so many other people, right? I just, in my family, we didn't always get along. And it wasn't just gender and race. We had Joe Fowler witnesses, we had Muslims, various iterations of Christians, people going to different churches. Um, my aunts were from Chihuahua, Sinaloa, Mexico. My uncles were black. So I grew up being able to negotiate blackness and diversity like breathing air. And we didn't always get along. We were families, right? Um, we, we, but, we, but we figured it out. And so that informed my and, and sort of fueled my desire once I got to college like a lot of other young people out in Arizona, black people, I went to predominantly the white school. I helped found the Black Student Union there. There were more non-black people in the Black Student Union than black people because of the what school. school was, uh, Alhambra. Okay. Alhambra High School, the Lions. Mm -hmm. um, so we welcomed everybody. Um, but, you know, there were only about 15 black folks when we founded the Black Student Union at the school. And uh, I played basketball and I went on to play basketball at South Mountain Community College and I made the coaches angry uh, one semester in, deciding not to play anymore because I found the books um, and then transferred to ASU during the height of the culture wars in the early 1990s. So can and, I pause you? Yeah. Uh -huh. Who was your game like? 
Well, you know, one thing I was no, just thinking hold before. On, before hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. No, I, 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 I I'm, I'm no, smiling for those who can't see me right now. I never knew he was a second. I never knew that. Perfect. Who was your game like? That's what I want to know. Oh, who was my game like? Uh, like a contemporary player? I don't. I, or that particular time? We can time. go back to Dave DeBusher. We can go back to Dave Bing. We can say LeBron James. Uh, I would say Clyde Drexler. Oh, so you smooth. In fact, my nickname <laughs> and my boys, if they hear this, will, will laugh because they still call me this sometimes. You know how the nicknames are. With Silk, because my jumper was as smooth as. Okay. This is, that's this real is, talk. No, this is driving. You didn't, you didn't know. No, this. this is driving me a little crazy. Why? Because I've, I've known Matt. We we've known each other. <laughs> you thought probably. you thought you knew Matt? No, no, no that's what I'm saying. Yeah. We've known each other. We met probably in the probably early 2000s. That's right. That's right. Somewhere around there. And I was, you know, so I was, so, so I was, I was doing it. Then, so let me ask know? this: Are you saying you can't look at Matt and you don't see basketball? I'm saying, had I known. He would have got some. About six three, six four, right? Six four. He would have got yeah. some. Six That's three and three quarters. So six four. He would have got some. And I could jump back in the day. <laughs> you heard this, right? Oh, oh, yeah. Oh no, and I no. See, we actually played on a three and three thing once. One of your boys came to town. That's it was a three. Right. Once. That, I remember. And I was now. mad out of shape. I remember. And, now. and when it was over, I was mad. I was like, man. So who's his game like? Oh, he's intense. Okay, but oh, that, oh, no, no. That's he, not skill, he's, uh, uh, um, He doesn't you, have to go there. You remember Rajah Bell? He he Kobe Bryant's nemesis on the Suns? Yeah, except I don't play defense. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> He had Rajah. You had Rajah Bell's all, his offensive. His And his, uh, yeah. Okay. Charles is competitive. <laughs> you know what? This is my, my brother, right? He can shoot. Charles can oh, shoot. Yeah, he can now, shoot. I don't know if, some, if it's a, somebody's in front of him if he can shoot. When he's wide open, that brother can shoot. Le- are you left-handed? Oh yeah, yeah, left handed. That's right. Because I remember seeing, I was like, oh, because I was born left handed, but I broke my my left arm, and I was in a cast for two years. I almost lost my arm, so I had to learn how to use my right. So I, I kind of use both. That that could have been like that. That could have been like the saver for you right there. I mean, knowing how to use both left or right, just didn't know. Yeah, it's funny too, because when I play basketball, I never I I never told people that when I got to high school that I was born left handed. Because oh man, you got mad. You could, your left is is you got mad skills with your left, and I didn't. Yeah. You just, I never told him that's not actually my dominant hand. <laughs> so, 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 all right, so we'll come back to sports, okay. which is you know culture. You you made the distinction your mom did uh, between a womanist and a feminist. In your opinion, yes. what's the difference? She didn't believe that feminism as we know it, or she knew it growing up, and certainly now accounted for the unique experiences of women of color, particularly black women. Got it. And so, you know, she said, feminism, I get it. I'm supportive, but it doesn't do anything for me. In part because when we were having our marches in this in the late 60s and early 1970s on behalf of what we would call black lives. Now, uh, you know, most of my white female feminist sisters didn't show up, but they expected me to show up at. The, you know, the uh, close, close the wage gap rallies, the, you know, things of that nature. And she argued that there was very little reciprocity. And until that reciprocity became ingrained in the movement, she needed to subscribe to a theory and a practice that um, spoke to the unique challenges that she and black women faced. She was also um, someone who identified as pansexual. Um, and so it just it just didn't really fit for her. You, like so many women of color, especially black women, when I was growing up, the, the issue was the topic was still, you know, working out of the home, you know, work and equal. Well, it was equal pay for equal work. My mom was saying for black women, we still haven't gotten any pay yet. White women are talking about equal pay and we still need to get the jobs. Got it. Right. Got it. So that's where, you know, that's where it came from. Okay. You were you were really raised in this conversation, right? I mean, this is this is a conversation that's pants spanned throughout your entire life. And I find that really interesting. Um one of the things I I, I love about Matt um is your deep knowledge in history. I know DJ is a history buff when it comes to where he's, you know, 
decided to sort of lay his roots. He wants to understand where he is and understand the history behind that. So I know you're the probably the most noted African American historian in the state of Arizona. I know you're an accomplished author on the topic. Um, how did all of this shape you from an early age to be so ing ingrained in understanding the history of, particularly the history of black folks in the state? That's a great question. First of all, shout out to Daryl because everything you described to him, that's a product of that Michigan State education. Um, I'm a Spartan uh, too, I, folks. I remember, so I just I remember, had to do that. Okay. So, um, but your, in your any event, your PhD was from state, right? That's from that's yeah, right. Yeah, Michigan absolutely. State. Um, I would say that um, my mom was a social studies teacher and uh, an historian, and so even before I came into a level of consciousness in understanding our unique situation, right? Because I, I was raised essentially in a closet. We had two female uh, queer teachers at a time where teachers would be fired because of rumors mm -hmm. of, of a same-sex relationship. And so I was raised in that environment. We had two phones. We had two mailing addresses. We did not shop at the grocery store in our own community because at least together, mm -hmm. then together. Um, and I was always stunned at how... how how, how many people didn't get it. But nevertheless, um, that was the, the environment that I grew up in. And um, between my mom's history lessons and social studies lessons at the dinner table and my lived experience, seeing people and accepting people for who they were and uh, and what they brought to the table was just normative to me, whereas other folks difference was not normative. Difference was abnormal. I gravitated to difference because of that. My grandmother even took me to visit different churches um, because she said, you know, she believed in one God, but she said, you know, different religions, you know, acknowledge the one God in, in a different way. That's your mom's mom? That's my mom's mom, my, yeah, my maternal grandmother. And, uh, and she worked for Jewish families as a housekeeper. So, you know, I, I, I learned a little bit of Yiddish and um, grew up eating matzo ball soup and going to seders and doing that type of stuff, too. Because she wanted me to learn, so it was like you said, it was just the air that I that I that I that I that I breathed, and then I got to college, and also local, also local, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. South Mountain Community College and Arizona yeah. State University undergrad okay. and my master's, and I got to college, and I didn't see any of the people mm. that I grew up with in the curriculum, in front of the classroom, in administration. Right. Um, any any of that. And I started asking why, you know, and then I met um, some pretty strident young brothers at, at ASU who I had anger in me. But it was it was it was not an anger that I distributed outwardly. It was an anger at seeing how people I love were treated. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was an intensity. But I ran into cats that were just like. I don't like this. We're going to take this building over until they decide to do right by us. And I thought, I kind of like this type of thing. Because I grew up in an environment where the women in my life and the few men who are around were strong. But it was, and, and they're, they taught me, you know, you need to just work harder and be smarter than everybody else and things of that nature. And as I matured, I thought, I respect them saying that. But this is some BS. Mm -hmm. Like, and not 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 disrespecting them, right? right not yeah. that, that, but but the fact that we are put in a situation where we have to say, in order for for us to be able to be successful, let alone safe, we have to be essentially perfect. And there's no such thing yeah. as perfection. Yep. So why is it the onus put back on the powers that be to do what they're actually? supposed to do which is to lead mm -hmm. and so when I got to university I didn't see any leadership in those areas and uh, in my work as a DEI specialist I I break down different stages of leadership based upon other some other people's work in my own and the first stage of leadership is what I call the uh, untouchable right I'm sorry not the untouchable the immortal that would be generation Z now right so they're younger 
they don't have any 401ks. They don't have 529Bs. They don't have little kids, a mortgage. They don't have any of that stuff to worry about. I didn't have any of that stuff to worry about. I didn't have to lose really anything. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, you're not thinking about your life Mm -hmm. at that point. Um, So I was out there. Somebody said, we need to go do this, protest that. I was there. And, uh, and I did it. And we were successful at a lot of things, even at, at ASU early on. But this was an outgrowth and an extension of my upbringing. This diverse family with a family that subscribed to what I now understand to be Christian liberation theology, using the Christian Bible to identify the hypocrisies within our society and the extent to which people use the Bible to actually oppress people mm-hmm. rather than to uplift people. Mm-hmm. So I took that Christian liber- liberation theology with my experiences and the history that my, that my mom taught me that wasn't taught in school, and I just sort of put all of that together, and that's how I developed my consciousness and desire to actually go out and change this stuff. Somebody said it recently, and I, and I believe it's true, and I believed it's true long ago when I didn't, I couldn't articulate it. And I forget, maybe you all remember who the brother who said this recently. He said, you know, the greatest threat to democracy is white supremacy, and the greatest threat to white supremacy is democracy. I couldn't articulate that back in the day, mm-hmm. but I believed it, and I still believe that, which is one of the reasons why I've given so much of my, my time to this. I do believe in the promise of America. I love that promise. We haven't begun to live up to it. And if we're going to realize that promise, we got to be real about what the real, but the, but the true threats are. And I don't think we've really got to that, to that point yet. Well, clearly not. So, so how do you approach that in the work that you do, Matt? Now, let me give a little bit of context. Um, I also do consulting work, DE and I, and when we talk about true threats, the most egregious, in my opinion, is what's happened to black folks in this country. Mm-hmm. We have found a way, meaning the broader society, to weave into the conversation other aspects of American oppression. Until we solve for what's happened around black folks, I'm finding it difficult to enlist in these other armies and fights that are, that are happening until we do that. And increasingly, I'm finding myself even more transparent about that in my work. What's your journey been mm-hmm. as it relates to that context? You know, it's, it's, been, it's interesting. When I first began this, I was, I was there with you in that... Uh, I want my focus to be about black people, black liberation. I'm thinking back into my college years, right? I knew a number of Chicano activists and white activists, particularly Jewish activists, who threw their lot in with us. And we were more than happy to, um, you know, extend the hand and work together in areas that we thought would benefit all of our communities. But we all understood we're unapologetic ab- about and okay with the fact that we all understood that each one of our primary focuses was our own community. Mm-hmm. And I think, that, quite frankly, that's what brought us closer together. Um, and then, you know, I earned my PhD. I go in, into the academy in the professional world, which really tries to dilute the ways in which the extent to which black people focus on ourselves. It doesn't matter if it's scholarship. It doesn't matter if it's it's community service. They don't like you doing too much of that because it's going to get away from the scholarship. But don't let the scholarship be too strident because now you're a political scientist. You're not a historian. You know, whatever the case may be, there's always some sort of critique that tries to draw you away from being authentic and, and, and truthful about painful truths. And so, but I, I was sucked into that in order to get things done Make making them palatable for other folks. I'm not in that space anymore. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the things that allows me, that inspired me to move out of that space was creating my own business. 
I didn't knew that that's one of the I didn't know that that was one of the reasons why I was creating it consciously. But I became aware of it once I founded my own business, when I figured out that there was a lot of stuff I just didn't have to deal with if I didn't want to. And that's where I am right now. Now, I'm real transparent about that, though, with potential clients. It, it's been, it, yeah. And that's one of the things I, I love about you, respect about you. And, and a lot of people, you know, people, some folks will do anything for a client. 100 percent. Or a contract. You're going to get what you sign up for, too. And you're going to get yeah. what you sign up for. Yep. I'm just not there anymore. Number one, it's not helping anybody. Even if they think that it's helping them, it's not it's not helping them. And I'm at my best self for you when I can be my true self for you. So if I have to bob and weave and tap dance and, yeah, and season everything to your taste um, and not make it too spicy, then uh, I'm not doing what's necessary really to move the needle and really justice in, in terms of, of my own community. And, and, and this is the last thing. And I agree with you. And one of the reasons why I'm doing that is because if America can solve the riddle of the legacy of its original sin, that is, it is continued to sin with regard to black folks. I think we, we will it'll help us develop a formula for other groups as well. Because wherever black folks have gone, we brought everybody else with us. Well, yeah, we D, DJ and I talk about that a lot in terms of where the attention sort of gets shifted when when it you know when the the wave is uh, palatable to do so, right? To move because it's, it's certainly it feels better, right? To move on because this is just so tough. It's so difficult to deal with because you stare at it and you know it is the original sin, right? As you spoke, um, you were. I know one of the things. And it sounds like. I'm I'm I'm, in, I'm I'm taking from your conversation that there was a lot of resistance when you were at Arizona State. I know you were the founder of the Center for Race and Democracy at ASU. Mm -hmm. I, I imagine that that was a, a, a tumultuous time trying to get even that uplifted and put into place. What was that like, bro? You don't <laughs> you don't even know, man. Uh, I was so green, even though I had been a veteran of like activist movement. This was different within the academy. Right. So even the name, you can't have a center for the study of race and you can't put race in the name of something. Um, nobody's going to accept that. The name. Um, well, race and democracy. Why can't you make it, you know, more more broad? Right. Um, to to explicitly include other people or other um, other challenges like sexism and things of that nature. I said, I, that's not what I want to do. And I said, um, <laughs> I don't want to do that. And I said. I don't think they're antithetical. So when I'm talking about race and democracy and the lives of black people, I understand intersectionality. So we're going to have conversations about all that. But we're going to center race because mm -hmm. nobody else is. And if I can't have race in the title, I don't even want to do this. And people looked at me like I was crazy. It's like, you, you're going to put all this effort in? And I said, no, look, if I have to go d d this type of stress over the name, then you all aren't ready for what we're actually That's what we're going right. to do. Mm -hmm. Right. So that was that the bill was introduced and the legislature to shut us down. Um, uh, yeah. Um, Kavanaugh, mm, um, yeah. not even knowing me right. or the center introduced a bill arguing that somehow we were trying to indoctrinate um, ASU students into liberal orthodoxy. Um, there was that. Um, the library that I built was raided. People, you know, stole some books. I bought a lot of books on democracy and race. And put them out in the in a you know uh, uh, general area so people could come and look at them. God came in one day; they're all gone. I had a noose uh, slid, um, like kind of jimmied into my door. It didn't go all the way under because it wasn't a space, but I had a noose there. And then, of course, when I mentioned it to people, some folks were just like, "Ah, you just a drama. You just making that up for attention." I and mean, it was it was crazy. Now I will say this: the 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 majority of my colleagues were supportive. Of the idea, at least intellectually. Mm -hmm. Intellectually. Now, what that means in terms of operationalizing what we wanted to do, that's in something entirely different. And um, and there were some challenges with that. There was political challenges over space. So I found some space that was empty. Nobody was using it. I'm thinking, well, nobody's using it. All of a sudden... Everybody wanted that space. When, when I said, I'm, I'm like, there's nobody there. 
Um, so, you know, it's this type of stuff, but this, this is not unlike what, um, you all experience in organizational development, right? And when you come with DEI, these are true microaggressions and macroaggressions, right? Um, we will undermine you at every stage or try to undermine you by nitpicking at everything from name to structure to who's on your board to, oh, you hired a Latina for your assistant. I knew you hired a person of color. Well, yeah, if you would have actually asked me, I would have said publicly, I'm going to hire an assistant that's a person of color. I'm not hiding behind that. Um, half of my, a little over half of my staff was, was were women. I did that deliberately. That caused a problem. Um, you know, my the advisory board was predominantly people of color. That caused a problem. You name it. Death by a thousand cuts. Oh, yeah. How much money I was making. Um, that caused a problem. You just you just name it. And of course, these are all stones to hide hands. Right. The real issue is we are supposed to know our lane and our place. hundred percent. As black people, especially as black men, you're supposed to hunt yourself over, uh, bend your back, speak softly, um, be successful, but never parallel or surpass others in terms of status or earnings. And then you deal with people who don't even understand why you're doing what you're doing. So the, the first book that I published, um, it came out before I got tenure. And I literally had somebody come up to me and she said, so congratulations on, on your book, but I'm not going to um, ask you to sign it until you get tenure. And I thought, see, this is the problem. You, this is why you think I wrote the book. You think I'm doing this for tenure? Right. So, you know, and then when you speak up, then you got the pushback and, um, and, and, and folks trying to attack you. And it happens all the time. You know, uh, I was just a little naive in that I understood the tax on the on the street. I knew how to deal with city vessels. The academic world is something different. And I had bought into the idea that somehow because these folks had advanced degrees, that they were somehow more erudite and mature and self-assured and less insecure um, and less racist mm -hmm. than others. Not at all. Not at all. In fact, in many cases, they're worse because they've convinced themselves that they're our best friends. Right. And that we have, you know, the, the best interest for it. Meanwhile, um, there's no serious recruitment and retention effort. Um, and they've and institutionalized that intellect in a way where they've convinced themselves that they own that. And that's really deep. So they become the gatekeepers for this hamster wheel of intellect that they continue to produce and reproduce mm -hmm. and want to make a decision around when they let us in, right? Um, so you, you've obviously, man, accomplished a lot. What are you most proud of when you think about your body of work or what you've created? Oh, wow. My first book, because I was a labor of love. When I got to ASU, I had a research project in the first African-American history course I taught, taught by one of the few black people on campus. And it was like, like it was this was the first person other than my mother that was really putting it down and teaching me stuff. And I went to the library and I couldn't find anything on black folks in the life outside of King and Malcolm X. And it just it made me very angry because it was like we had been written out of history. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I dedicated myself from that moment on. I wrote that paper for that semester. And then um, one of my advisors said, you know, this was really good. Have you thought about continuing this work? Because there's nothing written about black folks in Arizona. And I hadn't really. I wanted to be an attorney. I don't know why. Just because I had been told that attorneys you know, is a respectable thing, et cetera, et cetera. And um, they didn't tell you well. They didn't tell you right. And then, <laughs> so, you know, um, I came back to that later, but, 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 but I, um, I was upset, but I dedicated myself to that. And so that paper be then became a master's thesis and the master's thesis, a dissertation and the dissertation, a book. So basically I woke on, worked on that from 1990. 
2005 to 2001. And then it was published in 2005. So we're talking 10 years. And, and I, because it's not going to go away. Right. And even to even now, people who move to Phoenix, especially black folks, can go to that and learn about where we entered into this state from the 16th century up until 2000, at least. I'm getting ready to update the last chapter to bring us up to 2021. But that I would say. And then the center, because yeah. the center is still there. ASU. ASU mm-hmm. is still there. They have a new director. Um, What's the name of the center now? Center for the, it's still the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. I still get emails from them. Yeah, they're, they're, it's still, and, that, and to me, that's the greatest thing to see something that, that you create. When I created it, I said to my staff, I want this to do well long after I'm gone. Because I, I had no intention of staying there forever. Nobody, no, no one else knew that. But that's the thing about the academy. People just think you're crazy when you leave. Um, you know, and if you leave, you have to, something has to be wrong. Like, you know, I went to my, my share of drama, but I didn't have to leave. But um, people aren't used to f- folks um, prioritizing well-being over status. Mm-hmm. And at a certain point, you got to ask yourself, mm-hmm. how, how much is my soul suffering? Yeah, mm-hmm. um, to be here, and th- and that's where we're. And I was having a lot of fun actually helping move the needle for for people in their organizations in real time. So yeah, that that ended the book in the center, I think. Um, and I have the book, and uh, and it's signed by the way. There, there we so, go. Pre or post tenure? <laughs> 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 oh, 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 oh. Isn't that a trick? I don't even know. That's how crazy. That, that sounds so crazy, man. I was like, man, y'all can't even give a compliment. <laughs> Um, without an insult, it's just, that sounds so crazy. <laughs> so I, you know, those are the two things, and, um, and and the work continues. And I was saying before we came in here, uh, I was I was a, a little late because one of my clients is in Minnesota, and uh, you know things are cordoned off, and people are scrambling to uh, issue statements and um, and things of that nature, and um, you know I have I have to advise them to slow down sometimes and you know my questions are well what have you done thus far if i'm just you know beginning to work with them because i believe in being genuine and effective and and deliberate rather than being reactive and ineffectual right so you can't just all of a sudden have a hashtag and a statement if there's if there's no substance behind it in your organization so, you know, we had to have a conversation about that. So these are things you can do now, but these are, are, are um, performance art things that I think that you should avoid right now. It's better that you say later on, listen, we knew this was going on. And so we want to do our part internally to generate serious, sustainable change. Uh, and so this is why we're not chime in on this shit because we haven't really built the capital to do it. Right. And and I tell them one of the first things community is going to do is, okay, this is great. It's a statement. What are you doing? So if you don't have anything that you're doing yet, you might want to just push pause on the statement. Yeah. This, this <laughs> body of work, Matt, it's become so interesting. It has become the most prominent example where statements and discussions are proxies for solutions. We talked about it. We spent three days at an offsite. For the last month, we had discussions with our African-American and Latino employees. What are you committing to? Mm -hmm. What are you going to do over the next five years? What's going to change? But the solution has become discussions and narratives in these statements, right? Or a branding exercise that, yeah, I guess we'll go ahead and include some folks that we haven't included in on this. And, it, you know, one of the things I, you know, I'm hearing from you and you made the statement. You can choose who you work with. And there's nothing more exciting. Nothing more exciting. And you know what the thing is? A lot of them don't understand that. 
You have to explain it to them. You got exactly. You really have you to explain, have to explain it, to them. it to them. And it still blows their mind once you explain it. It blows to them. their they mind. They can't believe it. I, I was having a conversation with a potential client in the mental and behavioral health area. And some it was a partners. And uh, the, the partner who brought me in said, well, you know, I really want so-and-so to be on the call because, you know, he has some questions. And I said, okay, so this is somebody who's opposed to this. Right. Whenever I hear somebody say, well, they have some questions, I'm like, OK, this is this is a naysayer. And so I said, OK. And we had the conversation and this person was. You talk about infantilizing and just whimsical about we're all just, you know, we're all human beings and, and you know, just, just just these panacea type things that I just couldn't believe were being said. And, and I was asking questions about why are you reaching out to consultants? What is it that you want? Uh, where do you want to be in one, two, three, five years? How are you going to measure success? I'm asking questions. There's, there's no response to this. And so I simply said at one point, um, a lot of organizations aren't as far along or as developed in their consciousness with regard to diversity, to equity, inclusion, as they think they are. And being a CEO or a manager or an assistant manager doesn't, by virtue of your title, make you an expert. Ooh, this person was offended by that. I recently had the same exact conversation. You see what I'm saying? And he was offended. And and, told and that. I know. Oh, yeah. And I, and I, and I, I text my, my colleague because she was on the phone and I said... Um, not only are we not getting this contract, but I don't want it. <laughs> but it's hard for no desire. For, yeah, no desire. That's the thing. You know, people think that because you're out doing this work and I, I experience some of the same things in the work we do uh, in, in recruitment uh, and talent acquisition space. And, you know, we make it really clear all the time that we, you know, it's a selection process on both ends. We choose who we decide to work with. Right. Because. On one end, you know, I'm representing, you know, individuals in the marketplace who are looking for opportunities. And you also want to make sure that when you're doing so, that you're aligning them with the right kind of organization. And so if I can I can glean or from my conversations can see that this isn't the type of organization that, you know, people that I represent want to be aligned with, why why am I gonna take on that piece of business or that opportunity, it, it it doesn't mesh, right? And so, that that power of choice that we all have is is huge, right? Choice is a superpower, we say, and so. But I think we get sort of discounted from the fact that well, you need the business, don't you? No. There we go. So the unspoken not. paradigm yeah, unspoken and question paradigm. is, how can you afford to do that? Exactly. How can right. you afford to do that? Yeah. Oh, which is that, the flip. that's really the, that's really might what not it ever is. be spoken. That's what but it that's is. the that, question. Oh, that so is so I answer well it for him. I have no problem answering it for him. Which, what do you tell him? I'm just I got I, I, I got it. <laughs> <You're> just, <laughs> I, I, I'm, just, I'm just saying. Look, I I tell people what? listen. I say listen. This is my second career, and I prepare for it. And here's the thing. I don't do this for the money. I need to pay bills like everybody else. I like nice things. But I've been doing this since I was 13 in some way, shape or form, long before you were even thinking about this. And I'm going to continue to do it in some way, shape or form. And I derive most of my personal pleasure and validation from my own community. So I'm going to be fine from this. It's not just financial. You know, it's 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 holistic. It's you know, it, this is the way I respond because and, and sometimes I'll read their faces and I'll offer it up unsolicited because that's part of the educational process. Some of these people need a black person to look them in the eye and say, I can survive without you. And the companies, my clients that actually do the best are the ones that are willing, particularly the CEOs, to humble themselves and admit that just because they are a successful CEO doesn't mean they are prepared or have the skills to lead this effort. If they can, it doesn't mean I know everything, but, you know, I need CEOs that didn't stay at a Holiday Inn last night, right? That, that, that can't solve, I, I, don't, I need CEOs that can't solve every problem, 
right? And and I also need them CEOs that aren't intimidated, yeah, or my, at least to, to intimidate to the point where it's debilitating. My language is very similar to yours. I decided at the age of about 22 years old when my last day of work work would be. That was probably seven years ago. Mm -hmm. This isn't work for me. I do this because at times I enjoy it. So mm -hmm. in any potential client situation, I'm typically asked, what would make you discontinue this relationship? Mm -hmm. My response is always the same. The minute I determine you are not authentic. This is not about money. It really isn't. You're going to pay me. But I don't need it. I can't enter into any situation unless I feel that way. And that's how I feel. And I'm very clear with you. Anything I do, whether it's personal, professional, for me, I fuck with people who I want to be around. That's it. And the minute I decide I don't, mm -hmm. I'm out. And I, I can't, I am so clear about that up front. And I recently had a situation with a client where we decided to, I decided it's time to part ways. And there was a lot of disbelief. And I took them back to six months ago. Why are you in disbelief? We had this conversation. I don't know if you thought I was kidding. You know, you know what this reminds me of, though? I got to share with you. Because I've, I've read hundreds of diaries of former um, slave owners in the aftermath of enslavement during Reconstruction. And they are, in their writings, experiencing stunned disbelief mm -hmm. that their former enslaved people would be capable of such fundamental <laughs> repudiation that no, I don't have to work for you anymore and I'm not. And why are you smiling? You having fun? They, exactly. Like you're enjoying your you life, get, right? You know, uh, James Baldwin was said, you know, they, they were like wounded lovers just walking around looking <laughs> yeah. forlorn like they didn't know what was going on because they're, they're not used to us looking at them and saying, I don't need this or I don't need you. You know, and, and, and historically, one of the things that people have used to be able to control us is money. 100 percent. You know, is money. Folks do not like us to not need it, not want it. And they certainly don't like us to be in control of it. You know, that's that's the I'm sure some of you have come to. I've had folks come. They, it's a business. It says it on the website. You can Google it. But then they'll call up wanting like pro bono type of stuff. Yeah, now, we've... they don't make that assumption with any other supplier or in any other area or function of the business. But with this, yes, we diversity, equity, and inclusion. Okay, well, okay, this is what we do. This is how we do it. And this is our compensation structure. Oh, well, we hadn't um, really... Because they don't value it, right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so anything that we pay for typically, right, we value. Um, and so I think that's the root of it. Well, and we, we get the emails right from certain people. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, looking for perspectives and points of view. Uh, Timmy, we charge for this. Right. And All no, I'm time. not trying to have lunch with you and have a discussion. What do I benefit from the conversation? You know, one of my mentors told me to do once because I was having this conversation with him. And he said, young brother, send him an invoice when you're done. <laughs> and I was like, what? But they didn't ask for an invoice. Send them an invoice. Your, your, your website, all your documentation, lists everything. So either they didn't read it or they're making an assumption that you need to educate them on. And I did it. The first time I did it. <laughs> and they paid the invoice. But again, more wounded lovers. It was like, but I thought you did this because this is just what you do. No, I, I you know, this is... um. This is a commodity, like like anything else, and uh, it's fascinating. Just the, just the business standpoint, beyond even the ideological standpoint, you know. Uh, one, oh, and I should say this, and you haven't even asked me this, but it, it was on my mind on the way over here. One of the things that really gives me joy in this work is working with 
CDOs, chief diversity officers, directors of diversities, particularly those that are people of color, because they're in positions that I used to be in. And I can completely relate with many of their struggles. I was talking with one earlier today because she's dealing with what many of those folks deal with. And that is her office. Everybody else at her and at her level has a, has their own analytical assistant. She does not. Um, the, 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 the microaggressions, the every at every turn, there being some kind of objection to something. Right. And um, I love being able to just. Say, I get it. And then as the consultant, talk to the stewards of the organization in ways that she can't. And see, that work becomes so deep because the CDOs in less progressive organizations tend to sit in the people, talent, HR function, right? Mm -hmm. Which it's not an HR function, right? So if that role is not reporting to president slash CEO, like every other function head, that's conversation number one for me. Why would you have this person sitting in? So who checks HR when it comes to the CDO? She's going to check her boss. He's going to check his boss. Realize what you're doing by setting this structure up. You're putting a person in a position where they may have to check their boss who's sitting in a talent executive position. How do you do? How do you effectively do that? And and I had a past employer. That's the structure they preferred. Mm. They broke out of it. Now they're back into it again and more comfortable with that VP of diversity role sitting under the chief talent officer, which to me is a really ineffective approach. To, well, because to, you don't have, any, buffer you don't have well. any power to really affect any sort of real change. Bingo. Right? And 100%. I think that's the issue. And, and you know, I, 100%. Because I, little, I'm, sometimes CTO doesn't. Exactly right. Chief talent person is asking exactly to be at the right. table. And, and you need to understand, I mean, I was having a conversation with a client probably about a week ago about some diversity recruiting they were they were trying to, to employ and you know, my question was after we had a lot of dialogue, they're, they're fixated on, you know, a particular type of ethnicity and, you know, female gender along with that, you know, because they want to try to, you know, double dip and get, you know, the big bang for the buck. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and my question was, do you know why? Like, why? Why is this important? Like, wh why? Why? Why do you want this? This particular person in this role, in this sort of, you know, this grouping, if you will. And uh, they couldn't articulate the reason why. And I'm like, if you can't say why, that person is never going to be able to produce any value in that role. And that's what happens when you stick someone over here in this space underneath this other bigger umbrella, right? They're just over here spinning their wheels and nothing gets done that impacts anything other than the fact that we have this person in this, in this particular position. And we can actually put that out publicly and say, hey, we have this role. You see... And I think that is born out of what I call divided duty. And I wrote about this in an op-ed that I published months ago in the Orlando Sentinel. Uh, and, and I'm borrowing from a phrase that Ida B. Wells Barnett used in the early 20th century. And what I mean by divided duty is you have lots of white C-suites, mostly male, but not entirely so, white females too, who intellectually know that they should do something and they know that it's going to be controversial in some quarters and there's going to be pushback. But they want to do it anyway. But they wanted to do it in a way that makes the other white people comfortable. There you go. And to me, and this is what I tell the CEOs, that approach is antithetical to progress. You're never going to get what you want. If you, if you have to make the moderate to angry white people happy, in order to have this, right? What you need to do is to exert leadership, right? You are the chief executive officer. The problem is many of the folks who report to them in a lot of organizations are 
immersed in a sort of incestuous executive relationship, meaning that's probably a poor term, but like any coach or head coach, they bring their people with them. So most of the people that are the VPs of this or the, you know, assistant managers of that, they are people who they either used to work with or they brought with them from someplace else. Those are their people. So now you bring in more often than not the CDOs, the, the, the directors of diversity. They're either outsiders or they're coming not from that click. So now you have race. You have um, classes, potential classes, an issue. You have all sorts of things at work that are undermining that. And what you will not be able to see generally are the white executives, all of the little things that they do to undermine the person that they see as a competitor or somebody who should not be there in ways that are plausibly deniable, right? And you won't get it. What you will see is the growing frustration of your CDO who eventually will leave on average of three years. Mm -hmm. And you won't know why they've left. And you won't have any formal complaint against the other folks who actively undermine them because everything that they do to undermine them is explainable and justifiable within the organizational structure. But when you boil it down, this happened because you had divided duty. Instead of just doing the right thing for DEI, you wanted to do the right thing for your personal relationships with some of the folks who work for you and other white people. Let's just be honest. There's this thing called epidermal alliances. And you want some of the other high ranking white people to be happy. And so as a consequence, you can't let us become too too authoritative because that will be threatening to the other people. That phenomenon is so real. And you may actually have, in some instances, a white executive with a predominantly or 100 percent white executive team who is operating with arguably good intention. But they make the mistake that you just talked about mm -hmm. bringing on comfort. The issue becomes when that person's shortcomings undermine the work and the journey and arguably create an oppressive environment, then what do you do? And what typically happens is, well, do you think they maybe meant this? I know they said this, mm -hmm. but do you, th why are you hiring someone who needs an interpreter? Mm -hmm. Why is your executive team full of people who you have to come behind and clean up? Yeah. Especially when you lead in your industry. My question is, why did you hire them? You got to come back and tell me what they may have meant. It doesn't work that way. Well, I mean, typically, always they they knew what they were getting. Right, one hundred percent knew, knew what they were getting. But they liked the environment to keep the environment exactly. safe. We don't have to worry about it. Exactly. Right. But the minute you start bringing in intellect and awareness, then accountability has to ensue. Well, we see this in sports all the time. I mean, we, it gets illuminated because it's much more public and more visible. But that same phenomena exists in corporations as well. It's, it's so true. It's so true. I, I have clients across the board. This is a common concern that I'll hear. Well, we need to make sure that we move slowly. OK, I'm OK. I'm listening to you because and this is when they lose me. Right. Because, you know, not everybody in the organization is ready for this yet. That's absolutely right. And, you know, and, et cetera, et cetera. And, I, and I'm thinking 78% um, of your employee pool is white. And what you're telling me is you want to entertain discomfort with the fact that you have folks that are going to come in that want to help you make your, your company more reflective of not just your county and state's population, but the world, especially if you are a global corporate. Don't say you're a global corporation and then quote county numbers on, on diversity. Right. And, 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 and I'll say to them, 
imagine I actually said this in a, in a town hall to a group because there was a guy that was pushing back. And, uh, and I, I would like to direct this question to Dr. Whitaker. Um, and I can tell, by the way, he kind of he bit out Dr. Whitaker that that uh, he was a little salty. And he said, I just want to know if white guys are going to have any opportunities to advance in this corporation any further. Are we just going to be hiring people of color and women? Because I think this was this was all about. And I said, OK, this is why I have to be authentic. Right. So I said to him, OK, imagine you walk into a business. And seven or eight out of 10 of everybody in the business is black. You walk in as that white person in that business. Seven out of every seven out of every 10 people is black. Would you think to yourself, man, I bet black people are going to struggle for opportunities within this business? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. It's absurd. Right. But this is the angst that we're dealing with. And, and, and what we cannot do is enable that. That that angst, hence all deliberate speed, right? Right, and and hence why my narrative continues. I continue to do this work where I see fit, but I am definitely on this entrepreneurial track for young brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Be your own boss. Create your own environments, and be in a position as fast as you can where you don't have to ask for anything. You know, I got to tell you, that's interesting that you say that because anytime I get an opportunity to give, you know, because I get the question a lot of time from young brothers and sisters who are looking for some advice about, you know, typically it's career, you know, opportunities, opportunities they want to pursue. And I always say, have you thought about being an entrepreneur? Have you thought about yeah. what you could do in the business world to create something of your own? Because I really do think that changes that dynamic, it right? It, it changes everything it in terms, not only your options, but how you get to choose the work that you do, right? You know, you're, you're able to do things in a way where, as we all have articulated, you know, we get to set the standard for how we'll operate with people and what we expect in return, right? And so you don't always get that, you know, you recognize this. I knew it from when I was at, when I had a corporate career, you know, there was a lot of what, you know, the, the, the gamesmanship that went on that you had to navigate through. And I knew early on, you know, you, you managed, managed to have a, a super successful career. I mean, I re realized early on I would never make it because I just I just I wasn't wired that way. And I couldn't I wasn't going to navigate through a bunch of bullshit. And I figured early on I need to move in a different direction to create whatever I want to create for myself in my career. It's so true. I learned that late in life. And you're one of the people that advised me. I mean, you know, I was thinking about. You and I talked about a lot. We talked about a lot. But a lot of folks know what I want your listeners to know, too. And this is why brotherhood and mentorship is so important. Um, even if you're around the same age. Um, I went to you and I, was, and I said, you know, I'm really thinking about, you know, starting my own LLC because I'm doing a lot of speaking and it's sort of evolving into consulting. But I don't know what I'm doing. And, and we were at like. A gathering at your house, you know, just barbecuing and, yeah. and and you said, well, come come with me. And you took me into your room and basically printed out the LLC documents and walked me through it in that's the wonderful. moment. That's in the moment. That, that, yeah, that's powerful. You know, and, and I thought to myself, there's so many other people who would not have done that even at another time. And then we continue to talk over the years because for me, like a lot of folks, particularly black folks, you know, I come from, from a family. My grandmother was a housekeeper. My mom was a school teacher. There were no entrepreneurs in, in my family. So the idea of entrepreneurship was scary because I was raised in a family where we had a check every two weeks that the state usually was was giving you. Um, and a lot of academics don't want to admit that unless you're at a private school, but you work for the state, too. Um, I just want to throw that in there. Um, <laughs> and you're a teacher. You can call yourself professor all you want, but you're a teacher. So I was used to getting that check and the health care and all of that. And that scared me more than anything else. Well, what if and then I realized, well, you're not showing a lot of faith in your yourself. Right. And um, and over the years. I just needed, you know, friends and mentors like yourself to just bounce some ideas. And I remember Charles just like one day he was like, yeah, you don't need to be doing that. Just start. You need to just focus on this business and make it work rather than 
all of these other things. And it's when I did that. But see, it it's also all, it also transformed. We talk about entrepreneurship in terms of liberation and the ability to make money and center ourselves around who we want to be around. But what you speak to is one of the most important things. It transforms your entire self-identity. Everything. Then you start to understand what you're capable of. Everything. It really does. It you know, transforms your self-identity. I, I watched it. I watched it. My grandmother owned a florist for 60 years, you know, in the rural south. Uh, in North Carolina, and that that shaped it for me because I I saw how they were able to my grandmother and my grandfather were able to command respect in that community because of who they were and because of the work that they did, right? And they did it on their own. And people and so, people looked up to them exactly, when they walked in. Exactly right. And I don't care who you were. I mean, I I, I really do remember, you know, in in tumultuous times, particularly around race. Where, you know, they were well thought of in the white community as well as in the black community. You know, again, rural South. And I think largely because there was nothing anyone could take from them. They had built this on their 100%. own. 100%. Right? It's an, it's an institution. Absolutely. We're coming short on time, Matt. You know, one of the things I want to kind of go back to something you said. Um, you know, you were obviously on this PhD journey. Um, I was on a doctoral journey. And I focused on organizational crisis in my doctorate program mm. through the lens of sports wow. institutions. Okay. Take a guess what I found through this research was the most commonly occurring factor in organizational crisis. What? Uh, communication or... Now, no? Not bad strategy. Not bad. Not lack of collaboration. Self-preservation. Mm -hmm which is ultimately what we're dealing with. Once you realize that, yes. and you do it at a scholarly level, right? And it's like and I wasn't looking for that. I'm thinking wow, collaboration, poor communication, That's bad really strategy. Powerful. You know what? I could fight that all day. The research started to show me this is about self-preservation. This is about operating in self-preservation mode and survival mode. And then your whole identity shifts. And then everybody around you becomes a victim of that. Yes. Which is now we start to think about it. So I start taking this, my findings in this paper I'm doing, right? And I graduate and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to own this space. So now my approach, when I think about things, I start with that. I don't need to hear about strategy right now. I don't need to hear about yeah. what are you preserving? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. that's where my mind starts, right? Mm -hmm. I don't need to openly have that, but I'm going to get to what is it you're trying to preserve and hold on to? What is yeah. it? And once I discover that, that's when the work begins, right? Yeah, but I'm going to get to it, and you might not like it, but you're yeah. going to wake up next to it. <laughs> right? I love that. It's incredible. I absolutely love that. And if equity was in the bed, all you guys would sleep on the floor. And I'm going to make sure you know it. Wow. So for me, that was an awakening. That was a scholarly awakening that supported my experiences back in practice. And then I came out like, yeah, I hear you on strategy. I hear you on low collaboration. I hear you on lack of talent. What I didn't hear you say was you're trying to preserve something. Wow. Deeper That's than ocean. powerful. Deeper than ocean. Very and I got to say this quickly because I know we're running out of time, too. What I found and what helped me go after um, this business and others was my coming to terms with the fact, actually, my wife, I got to credit her with this, coming to terms with the fact that being authentic and being myself is enough, right? And not some folks. Boom. I'm not going to be their cup Boom. of tea and other people I will. And my wife says that my wife is white. And she said to me one day, she said, listen, let me, I can't, I, you know, I'm not authority on black people, but let me tell you something about white people. And I said, okay. And I sat down and she said, there are some white people who are not willing and able to hear what you're going to say, but there are others that will listen. And they would rather have your authentic self than some pretend self. They don't want to be condescended to. They may not agree with you, but they'll at least let you just interact with you that way. And I said, really? And so I started practicing that. And what I found is I'm fine. 
Right. So uh, most of my clients, um, you know, they've 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 come. We've negotiated a deal. We don't know how to do this. We could use your help. Um, and and I say, you know, I'm, I'm a very authentic person. I'm, I'm going to be um, transparent and approachable. I'm not going to I'm not going to bite anybody, you know, but um, but I'm going to say some things that are going to be uncomfortable at times. And some most of them don't shy away from it. So the, the, the what I had bought into was somehow I have to um, rein myself in, so to speak, to be successful. Right. Absolutely. I, I, I made assumptions myself right about owning our own assumptions. I made assumptions about what folks, generally speaking, could could accept and could not accept. And. She said to me, too, she was like, listen, some people like McDonald's and some people like Jack in the Box. Like some people you're not going to get. Some people are not going to want your product. There are others that will focus on them, you know, and, uh, and and just build what you believe people need and then work with the people who come to it and others that don't don't. And I thought that was a, and this is what I tell younger folks too, particularly young black men now. Please be your authentic self where, wherever you go. Be hardworking. Shoot for excellence. You know what I mean? But don't get in the business of disassembling yourself and your soul in order to make people happy. You, 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 you don't do that. It's been very successful for me. That and having multiple streams of income. That always helps. That was a light bulb we went off. I was just like, That always what? helps. Always helps. <laughs> that always, always helps. helps. I mean, you know. And I was doing that while I was working. Always, so you know what? Always. Hey, if I'm going to get my benefits, get my MBA paid for, and I can create some other streams of income, why won't I take that paycheck? Yeah. You know what? It's actually made me a much happier person. And as a Absolutely. consequence, I think it's made, it's made me somebody who's easy to work with, to yeah. be honest with you. This has been Brother, tremendous. we could do this all day. All day oh, long. man. Man, we could do this long. all day. This has been great wonderful, dialogue. Matt. You know, I think we just have to do it again. That's what it's and pick up where we to. left Y'all got to have me back. This we'll, was, this was we'll fun. We'll do it again, for sure. For sure. Well, let's definitely do it. No this, is, this is beautiful. And thank you for joining us to The Conscious Vibe.